this uh, method. And for those um, uh, who uh, don't know, this is for those who don't know or don't like uh, cricket, here's what one day cricket is. It's a game between two teams where each team plays an innings and uh, both teams get 50 overs and uh, both teams have uh, 10 wickets. Okay. The goal is the following, the team batting first, um, let's call that team one, uh, it tries to maximize its score uh, using its overs and wickets. Now the thing is, uh, uh, it tries to maximize this because the bowling team uh, is essentially going to chase this particular target. So it has to essentially try to set a target as high as possible. And of course the bowling team's goal is to keep it as small as possible. So that's, let's call that team two. Uh, it tries to restrict the score because this is going to be uh, this particular team's target in its, in, during its innings. So the bowling team then gets to bat and tries to reach the target within 50 overs. Okay. So this is a shorter version than uh, test cricket. I think uh, all of us have grown up uh, with it, whether we like it or not. And uh, the good thing about this is uh, that it always has a win or a lose outcome. Well, almost always has a win or a lose outcome. Occasionally there are some ties and they are a lot more exciting as well. But of course, now there is a short, even shorter version that has taken over. But we'll study the 50 over one. It also, uh, uh, this format became popular in the 70s, 80s, 90s because compared to test cricket, it often leads to exciting finishes. Okay. When you have a match where you want an outcome, okay, a positive, that is an outcome where one team wins and the other team loses, it's not good to have this. Uh, particular game messed up by weather, bad weather often leads to very interesting twists and turns in test cricket. I don't know how many of you have essentially followed test cricket and uh, uh, here is a team that's struggling to save its wickets and uh, everyone is watching when it will rain, okay, so that uh, the team could essentially uh, uh, get some uh, time thanks to the rain and then um, uh, somehow manage a drop. So it often leads to very uh, exciting twists and turns in test cricket. Also, uh, the pitch, the, the nature of the pitch changes uh, significantly when it rains uh, in test cricket and that also leads to some uh, uh, excitement, some uh, uh, radical um, outcomes and so on. But in one day games, you don't want this to happen. So you want essentially uh, rain to be as far away as possible and uh, it's not tolerated in this uh, result oriented uh, uh, format. So there simply isn't uh, time unlike in test cricket uh, for the match to continue on another day. So there have been occasions when reserve days have been used. So do any of you remember any games where reserve days were used? Okay, yes. Ah. Okay, and so what did they do at the end of yeah, the trophy was shed. But uh, they did have a reserve day in the hope that they could complete the game on uh, the second day. But uh, it turned out that uh, the rain gods uh, had another thing on their minds. Anyway, draw is not a good outcome in knockout competitions anyway. So if you want to essentially declare somebody as a winner, we don't want a situation where the cup is shared. It's not exciting at all. So um, we we don't want draws. So we, that that's why even in soccer, you have the penalty shootout. So the game could have been extremely close, maybe one team in, in uh, football um, uh, possessed the ball significantly, made several attempts uh, to uh, score and then eventually comes this situation when the match is decided by a uh, penalty shootout and then the other team wins. So uh, such things are not uh, uh, good to have but nevertheless you want some outcome and therefore you settle for such a thing. So what we would like to do, but rain is sure to come in many matches, particularly if you hold uh, a match in Bangladesh during the rainy season, it is bound to come. So we would like to essentially come up with a means by which we continue with the match, maybe revise the target, shorten the uh, length of the game and so on, and then come up with an outcome. Okay. All right, decide a winner based on the state of the match if play can't continue. So if, suppose you have to stop the game, so you have to decide who the winner is. Okay, I want to give a few examples, uh, some prior approaches through some examples and then we'll see uh, some uh, shortfalls of those uh, approaches and then uh, I'll tell about the Duckworth-Lewis method. Okay, so this was a method uh, that somebody used to essentially come up with an outcome. It's called the average run rate method. It's actually the first method that you would think of. If you were to come up with a rule, 
uh, to decide who the winner is um, and you did not uh, uh, think about it too much, this is the method that you would uh, come up with and uh, given the lack of experience with such met, uh, with, with the nuances of the game, that is precisely what the first people that uh, came up with the method um, used. So, here is the example, uh, this is uh, something called uh, the Benson and Hedges World Series Cup, it used to happen in the 80s and the early 90s. Uh, is there anybody here who was who was around during the 1988-89 time? Okay, yeah. But these were exciting times for us because we were growing up, and every one of us that you, that played cricket dreamt of uh, making it uh, to some level. Um, and uh, so we were all avid followers of this game. So I remember uh, watching uh, many of these games, uh, particularly the Benson and Hedges World Series Cup. Uh, so, this is a third final between uh, Australia and uh, the West Indies, okay, those teams are still there, so it is not all that irrelevant, okay. What happened was Australia scored uh, 226 for 4 of 38 overs and it so happened that actually once the game started, uh, there was uh, within the very, very first, after the first few overs were bowled, uh, rain actually stopped play and that is why they had to essentially bring it down to 38 overs in the first place. And so, uh, uh, two hours of uh, play was lost, uh, there was a two hour delay and uh, this was, I say initially, but it was actually during the initial parts of the Australian inning, there were about four overs or thereabouts which were already played during Australia's innings. And so, the match was reduced to 38 overs and Australia scored 226 for 4. West Indies uh, followed and uh, at some point of time, they needed 180 runs of 31.2 overs. So, 180 runs of 31.2 overs and rain stopped play and this time rain stopped play for 1 hour 20, 25 minutes. Now, uh, I do not know how many of you are uh, familiar uh, watching the game, um, uh, 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 how many of you essentially keep track of how many overs to bowl and so on, but in 1 hour 25 uh, minutes, how many overs can you bowl or how many overs is a team that is bowling supposed to bowl? Around 20, okay, that is about right. So, you are supposed to bowl about 15 overs in an, in an hour, okay, between 14 and 15 overs in an hour and uh, that, that amounts to about 4 uh, minutes per hour roughly and so that is 15 plus another 6, so roughly 16 overs or so. So, 15 to 16 overs, sorry, 15 plus 5, 20 overs or so is essentially what was lost and so that is exactly what happened from 31.2 overs, 20 overs were docked off and West Indies was asked to score something in the 11.2 overs that were left, okay. Now, what did they do? They used what is called the average run rate method. So, they found out what at what rate Australia had scored, okay, that is 226 uh, over 38 overs, that is a certain run rate. If 20 overs are docked off, let us actually remove exactly that many runs per over times 20 overs, okay. That is called the average run rate method. So, this is what you would naturally use yourself. Uh, in your street cricket uh, uh, encounters for example and they came up with a revised target of 61 of 11.2 overs. I think um, they had several wickets in hand. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, two of the fantastic openers from West Indies of that time was uh, were Desmond Haynes and uh, Gordon Greenidge and uh, they, they would have just chopped this off in no time. Okay, so, 61 over runs of 11.2 overs, they actually easily won with 4.4 overs to spare. Of course, now in T20 cricket, this is as Rajnikanth, the superstar Rajnikanth would call, he will call this Jujubi, okay. So, um, uh, West Indies won quite easily uh, with 4.4 uh, overs uh, remaining. What was the problem here? West Indies had it too easy, why? They had wickets in hands, yes. Correct. All the, I mean, they pro, they had several wickets in hand and they had only 11.2 overs. So, they could essentially afford to take a significant amount of risk and uh, score this in a much faster time than 11.2 overs, okay. Uh, and uh, therefore, if you were to revise it now, keeping in mind the uh, hindsight that we have, that they have wickets in hand, um, what would be a, a guess of what the target would be? By the way, I should ask some questions, right? Okay. So, I think you should give something to that uh, person. Who answered this question? They had wickets in hand? Okay. Okay. So, there is, uh, okay, all right. 
So maybe I should uh, warn them that there is possibly a reward and then uh, ask the question the next time. Okay, what would be a good target uh, to set for West Indies? Ele sorry? 11 point? Sorry, I didn't follow. Some Somebody said 11 point something. Uh, in 11.2 hours, how much would you set? What target would you set? Uh, around 100. Well, actually, it depend, doesn't it depend on, like, for example, uh, suppose West Indies uh, needed 180 of 31.2 hours, but they had only one wicket in hand. What would you do? Okay, so we have to think about, uh, or if they had all 10 wickets in hand, what would you do? Okay, so we'll have to think about this okay, a little bit more. And that's the content of the next example. And here's a hypothetical example. So suppose team one uh, plays uh, uh, 50 overs and it scores 250. Okay, so maybe uh, uh, when I grew up, uh, this was a good score. Maybe now I should have 300 or 325 or something like that. But the run rate is five per over. And so it uh, enables uh, easy computation. Um, team two replies. Okay, Rain uh, somehow stops play at around this point, at the midpoint. Uh, but team two has scored about 120. Okay, and they have not lost any wickets. I, I, I pointed out that perhaps we have to take wickets into account. Let's see what uh, should happen. And this should essentially uh, make us or uh, get us thinking. Team two replies and it uh, has scored 120 for no loss in 25 overs. Rain has stopped play. Okay, who's the winner? Remember that we have to declare a winner because this is one day cricket. Okay. Well, it's team two. Team two is the winner. Why did you say team two? They have all the kits in hand. Okay. So if you employ the average run rate method, though, according to the average run rate, ARR stands for average run rate method. What is called par score, that is the thing that they have to cross. Okay. That, that would be the revised target. The par score, uh, according to the average run, run rate method, is well. Uh, they had uh, played 25 overs. Team 1 scored at the rate of 5. 25 times 5 is 125. And so they need to get to 125. They are equal. 126, they win. Okay? That's the average run rate method. Now, all of you said 120 for no loss. Team 2 wins. Right? So you said team 2. You will declare team 2 as the winner. Okay? So according to the average run rate method, team 2 loses. And you all somehow agreed that it's not fair to team 2. Okay, so somehow you have said that team 1 should lose, team 2 should win. What if it was 120 for 2? 120 for 9. Okay, let's see. 120 for 9. That's easy. Team 1 should win now all of a sudden. So the par score uh, that they must cross uh, is essentially something that... Uh, um, so, so the par score for 120 for no loss should not be 125. It should be something that's smaller. But the power score when their state is 120 for 2 should be a little higher. And the power score when they are 120 for 9 should be even higher. So that you declare that they are below the power score and therefore team 2 loses. How do you come up with what the power score should be? Ah. Okay. Okay, so in a, in a so that's an important consideration. So in a in a game where uh, team one played and scored 250, I didn't tell you how many wickets team one lost. Maybe team one on the 50th on the 49.6 that ball, they lost their last wicket. Okay, in that situation, what would you do? In another situation where it's 250 for no loss, what would you do? If the match did not get interrupted by rain. Does it matter? Yeah, so Okay, so what you are saying is that it's the state here, the number of wickets that it has lost that matters. But her point is that does the pattern of uh, the wickets lost, does it matter? Should it matter? From this stage on, should it matter? What What are your, th I mean, every every answer is a correct answer here. So let's see if you can justify it. First, let's hear you. Ah. Okay. 
but how does it how does the fall of wickets up to that time matter it's only the fact that nine wickets have been lost and they have only one more wicket in hand how does the fall of wickets actually matter Okay, so that means you are looking at only the average number of wickets, uh, number of balls bowled per wicket. That's here. All that information is here in the nine wickets. Just as two fifty in fifty overs has all the information that you need. So the fall, the actual pattern of the fall of wickets is inconsequential. And if you want to find out at what ra average rate it has fallen, it's here in the one hundred and twenty for nine state. Next person, somebody else had a question. All the? If not all wickets are equal, if there are like three wickets now, you would expect that it will be hard for the bowling team to get the fourth batsman out because we just did a qualified batsman. Okay. So, uh, then it's more likely that the team won't be able to change. So, the day that there is more likely to get out. Okay. So, what you are also saying is that in addition to the fact that they have lost nine wickets, uh, you need to also take into account which batsman is playing. So, for example, if it is Harbhajan Singh and uh, and uh, let's see who else, uh, Varun Arun. Eh? This is over 15, 127 uh, uh, instead of 120. Uh, then we would have declared team 2 as the winner. Yes. So, that would have been unfair for team 1 because they were able to drop 9 wickets. They were still able to drop 9 wickets in 25 overs. So, even though the pattern does not matter, this fact matters that, that they have lost 9 wickets must matter. So, uh, that makes sense right because what you are saying is that, that they have lost 9 wickets must matter so that you can declare here that team 1 is the winner. But which wicket they have in hand somehow you should not take into account Be just because for the same philosophical reasons that who scored those 250 runs there does not matter it is only the target that matters. But one could argue that no, no, no. You should also see which batsman is playing and come up. Well, one could make a make a point, and you have to essentially uh, make some decisions here. One more question. Ah. That so uh, a good so in other words, what you should also do is you have to keep track of the past averages of each of the batsmen that are surviving and you have to essentially set a target based on that. Well, you could you could do that which means that uh, um, well, uh, let me take it to the extreme. Sometimes the way to address these questions are I have to take it uh, to the extreme. Um, so, let us say that uh, the West Indi uh, what is the best team now? India. India. Okay. So, and what is the worst team? Zimbabwe. Let us say that India and Zimbabwe are playing. Okay. Why should they even play? Why do not we take into account the past averages of the batsmen and why do not we take of the batsmen from India and why do not we take into account the past averages of the batsmen from Zimbabwe and then just decide the game up front. So, the I have what I have done is I have essentially taken the suggestion that you have and I have taken it to the extreme. And I have said that rain has stopped play, declare the game right at the beginning. No, no overs were, were bold, declare the game right at the beginning and just say India has won the game. Is that a good outcome? Okay, so somehow then you should not, if that is the case, by, by this example of taking your argument to the extreme, I hope I have convinced you that perhaps you should not take into account who the batsman is. All right, but you probably should take into account how many wickets have been lost and uh, so on. Okay, so interesting. So these are the kinds of questions that uh, one must raise and one must address. Uh, j let me just make my point. One must address before you come up with a, a method that uh, becomes applicable. So it's it's not an easy task to devise a method that uh, um, uh, will be accepted. It will no matter what scheme you have, it will always be criticized. But uh, the, it should find wide acceptance and you have to address a lot of questions. You had a question. Uh, so, I have to consider the case that the other team won by 25. No. Uh, for the following reason that the pattern of play for the first uh, team does not matter. It is only the target 
So the rules of the game are that in an uninterrupted game, it is only what the uh, uh, target that the first team has set that matters, right. So if you essentially take into account the pattern of play, the that is a that is a legitimate rule that you can set, but you must set it up front. You must tell it up front so that the teams can essentially take that into account. And then that becomes a new game. Maybe you should call it twicket instead of cricket. Okay. No, but the thing is the fact that there is always the possibility of a rain. Uh, if rain comes and stops play, what should be my strategy to win is something that is there in their minds. They are always in you know, the players at any stage are essentially thinking about every eventuality and they are preparing for those eventualities. And therefore, you have to take into, so the rules of play become different when you essentially uh, make the suggestion that you make. Okay. So we'll see how that's taken into account. Yes. Okay. So we'll we'll see. So something like that is what is being done. Yes. Last question, and then I'll move forward. Yes. Yeah, it could be a batting pitch or a bowling pitch. It could be, uh, yeah, that's that's true. You could take into account in this particular pitch, like for example, Bangalore. Bang so, what's the nature of the Bangalore wicket, KSCA Stadium? It's a batting wicket. Why? It's a very small ground. The, the ground is fantastic. Water drains dramatically fast and then it just, and then it goes all the way to the boundary. That's it. Uh, so it's a it's a it's a fantastic. I mean, I, I hope all of you have uh, gone and uh, seen the ground. It's an amazingly uh, 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 fast wicket and slow, <laughs> and and uh, and a batting wicket. So perhaps what one must take into account is not all games, but games in this particular ground. How were they played in the past? And then you might have to set a target. So this is another consideration that was taken into account. For example, in uh, Sydney cricket ground. What is the characteristic of Sydney cricket ground? Uh, batting wicket, but it is also one of the longest wickets, right. So spinners can essentially uh, drain the batsmen because you just cannot loft them all the way. So uh, you can essentially, thanks to the long boundaries, uh, you can essentially uh, take those catches. You can essentially set a field that uh, uh, drives the batsman nuts and he hits and he gets caught at the boundary. So th there are some interesting things that uh, arise which are ground dependent. So how do you take those things into account is uh, uh, something that uh, um, uh, has, has bothered people. But <coughs> in the current method, they have not taken these ground factors into account. But what they have taken into account is the history of all past games without any regard to uh, the ground. Maybe you can uh, take the ground situation into account because the game is being played here. I mean, you should make use of that fact in some way, right. So uh, it is a legitimate approach, but no one has taken and perhaps one of you can uh, think about doing such a thing. Okay, anyway, so it has gone into auto search. Okay, I have another 25 minutes, okay. <laughs> All right, so um, all right, so um, let's actually look at uh, another uh, example. Sometimes you have to do stupid things uh, to be able to come up with something better. Better, and here's the most uh, stupid rule that that was ever devised. Okay, and I want to essentially highlight. Um, the comical aspect of this particular method, although uh, one of the teams was eliminated and that was a tragic outcome uh, because of this method, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it has some comic uh, relief. Here is uh, the situation. It was the 1992 World Cup semi-final, okay, England versus RSA. England made 252 for 6 of 45 overs. The match was actually shortened because of rain at the beginning and so they said that, okay, 
we have lost 10 overs. So I am going to give you give each of these teams 45 overs, 45 overs. So, that it is a 90 a 45 plus 45 over game. England made 252 for 6. Okay, good score at the, in, during those days, 45 overs. And South Africa was chasing. Okay, and they were 231 for 6. Okay, that means uh, if you do the calculation, 21. Yeah, 22 runs needed and they had 13 balls left when rain stopped play for 12 minutes. So, in these T20 days, what would you think of this particular score? Probably South Africa should have essentially won. Okay. Um, in these T20 days, but during those times, you have to essentially uh, rewind to those times when things were slow. John T. Rhodes was there by the way. So, uh, but um, uh, things were slow. This was actually a tough score. It was a nail biting uh, finish. Uh, RSA had a chance, but I think England possibly had the upper uh, hand at that time. Ah, okay, rain. <laughs> uh, okay, rain stopped play for 12 minutes. Okay, that's roughly how many overs? Well, actually, for 12 minutes, you can bowl 13 balls. So the match must have been called off. But they actually said, no, we should give South Africa a chance. And they said, okay, we'll remove from the 13 balls. 12 balls, okay, you get one ball, okay. But what do you have to score? So, here is what they had to score. They had to score 21 runs of the last ball, okay. Is this impossible? 21 runs of the last, so quiz question, okay. Uh, okay, so whom do we, okay, maybe I'll ask uh, another question. So, maybe this, uh, because every one of you answered, I can't give a reward for this, but. Uh, Maybe another one. Okay, so it is not impossible, uh, but come on. Uh, do you know of a situation where uh, Australia and New Zealand played? And uh, there was a similar situation where they had to score a six of the last ball. Okay, and what happened during that game? This was a disgraceful situation for Australia. Yes, okay. So who was the person that. Okay, now, who was the person. Huh, sorry? No, no, no. This for this question, whoever answers will get a reward. Okay, what's the question? <laughs> huh? Sorry. No. Who was the captain? Uh, okay. So I think you should give it to him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it was a disgraceful situation where they had to score uh, six runs of the last ball, um, and. Uh, what happened was uh, there was quite a bit of discussion and uh, there was a Benson and Hedges game that was played uh, uh, in the United Kingdom uh, that essentially disallowed underarm bowling, but they had taken that particular phrase off and they knew about it. And so underarm bowling was technically legitimate and they even told the New Zealanders that we are going to bowl underarm. Okay? But then uh, I think it just was not cricket. When, when such a thing happens. It is a gentleman's game after all, so you cannot uh, you can't do such things. Anyway, uh, Republic of South Africa had uh, to score 21 runs of the last one. The criterion that they used was the, was the um, uh, essentially in some sense the source of inspiration for the Duckworth-Lewis method. They used something called the most productive overs method. So, in other words, basically uh, the, the team that essentially batted first was allowed to keep the most productive overs. That means if two overs were removed, the two least productive overs were essentially removed from the batting team's uh, point of view. But this is kind of funny because uh, South Africa is the one that is chasing and they actually struggled to bowl really well and these two overs were maidens and what happened? The, they actually did well and they were being penalized for having done well. South Africa restricted in these two overs uh, them to about one run or so, but they were being rest, they were being penalized for this. The two good overs that RSA bowled were struck off and it was being penalized for doing something well. Come on, this is ridiculous. This ought not to happen. Okay. And so, um, uh, this uh, reporter asked on the radio immediately after the game, is there so surely someone somewhere could come up with something better. Okay. And so, enter FC Duckworth and uh, AJ Lewis. Okay. All right. Uh, so, um, when you the test, the, the uh, 
the proof of the pudding in it is in its eating, right? So, we will have to see how this particular method, Duckworth Lewis method, fares in these two ridiculous situations the West Indies Australia game and the England uh, Republic of South Africa game. Okay, so West Indies' initial target would have been 232 of 38 overs due to the two hour interruption during Australia's innings. But the revised target would not have been the 60 of 60 odd runs of 11.2, it would have been about 139 using the Duckworth Lewis and uh, Duckworth and Lewis uh, method. It would have been 139 of 11.2 overs. And this would have been a fair game because I think uh, they had enough wickets on their hands and it is uh, possible at, at prior to the interruption it was a sort of fair game. Post uh, the interruption also it ought to be a sort of uh, fair game and therefore um, this seemed like a reasonable uh, target. Australia could have been, uh, th there is also another reason why this target is somewhat uh, higher than the uh, 10 runs per over that I think some of you mentioned. Uh, I think uh, what, what was the target roughly that you had mentioned about 100 something, right? Uh, uh, 100 or so. This is actually a little bit more and that is because Australia started playing, played for about 4 overs or so and then rain stopped play and brought it down to 38 from 50. So, had they known or had they encountered, uh, sorry, had they known that they would essentially have uh, this uh, eventuality, then perhaps they could have been a little more aggressive. Okay, so, they, have, they could have taken that into account and therefore, uh, West Indies was essentially set a higher target given that Australia did not have an opportunity to make good of the fewer number of overs uh, in the first few overs. Okay. Uh, what about the second game? Uh, what do you think would have been a reasonable target uh, from one ball? 3 or, or 4 runs, okay. So, here is what the Duckworth Lewis uh, method gives. Uh, Republic of South Africa would have needed 2 to tie and 3 to win. So, 3 runs to win in one ball, okay. That seems like a more, re they had a fair chance prior to the break and maybe this gives them a, a fighting, uh, a chance but they can still fight and be in, okay. There is actually an, a newer version of the, of the method which says no, 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 it is not uh, a 2 to tie and 3 to win but 3 to tie and 4 to win. So, depending on which version of the Duckworth Lewis method you use, the outcome would have been different. Okay, both are reasonable targets. Uh, at least you will believe that yes, okay, this uh, is something that is available. Okay, just to summarize the kind of interruptions uh, that uh, one will encounter in a, uh, in a rain interrupted cricket or, or some other uh, interruptions may also uh, cause uh, stoppages of play. Uh, Here is one kind of interruption. Before the first team's inning, something happens and you can't play the full 100 overs. Yeah. Then it is quite simple, both teams know before they start play that they are going to have fewer overs. What should you do? You should just shorten the game, okay. So, that is uh, the easy case to deal with. There is possible interruption during the first innings, okay. repeated interruptions could happen in the first innings possibly or maybe there is one interruption like in this uh, uh, Australia West Indies uh, game. Um, you have to be able to handle that. There could be a stoppage of play in between the two innings, okay. So, that also has to be dealt with or during the second team's innings as in the um, uh, South Africa and uh, England game. In which case, we might have to shorten the game and we have to revise the target as well. But do not use the most productive overs method. Stoppage without reception, then you have to declare a winner. That This is another uh, possible situation, okay. So, is this clear? Uh, you're, if you come up with a method and uh, all of you should think of, you have ideas uh, uh, teeming within you. So, maybe you should think of a means by which uh, uh, you can come up with a method. The standard is now quite, uh, the bar is high because the Duckworth Lewis method uh, is somewhat accepted now. But uh, there is always room for one more method. So, if you have a good method, perhaps one that takes into account the ground, then it would be considered. Okay, so these are the uh, thing kinds of interruptions that we have to deal with. So it has been in use uh, since 1997, and maybe I'll give some example. The first game where it was used. Okay, roughly how many? What percentage of the games get affected by rain is another question. You, know, you come up with this method, but uh, if uh, rain affects only about one in a thousand matches, maybe it's not worth putting this much amount of effort. 
Uh, it turns out that about uh, maybe um, yeah. less than 10 percent, but a significant fraction enough that it warrants uh, a detailed study of this method. A significant fraction about let us say 10 percent of the matches uh, do get affected. I used to know this exact number, but uh, I do not recollect the exact percentage, but it is about uh, 10 percent or less. Okay. So, here is uh, the first time it was tried out in 1997. Okay. So, it took quite a few years to develop and then eventually it was being tried out about four and a half years after the uh, after the World Cup, 1992 World Cup came. Zimbabwe was this uh, England, Zimbabwe played 50 overs and they scored 200 runs and rain shortened the game to 42 overs during England's innings. And uh, if you use the average run rate method, you would essentially get a score target for uh, uh, England for of 169, but the Duckworth Lewis target whatever that method uh, supplied uh, is uh, 186 and therefore um, England had uh, to score in the I do not know um, I do not know at which point it actually stopped, but they eventually scored 179 of uh, the 42 overs and so by the ARR method they would have won, but the result was they lost according to the Duckworth Lewis method. Okay, has has been the preferred method with some modifications for resetting targets and shortened games. There are many other methods actually I just want to list out a few and some of them were actually tried out in World Cups. Uh, ARR and MPO are two things that I already described, um, but there was a discounted version of most uh, productive overs. Uh, there is also another method which was a sort of curve fitting method, PARAB stands for some parabolic uh, curve fitting. And so, uh, this provides uh, diminishing returns for overs in terms of runs. So, this perhaps took into account uh, uh, yeah, anyway. So, we will we, we'll see uh, this was a this was a good approach and I will tell how uh, the Duckworth Lewis method essentially takes into account or discounts runs and overs in an appropriate way. The, an adaptation of this was essentially the one that was used in the 1996 World Cup. But that one actually ignored wickets in hand. So, for 9, for no loss, for 2, 120 for 9, 120 for no loss, 120 for 2. That essentially ignored uh, this, this particular aspect. There is another method called Clark method, uh, which applies uh, somewhat different rules for different kinds of stoppages. But what we would like is a, some, uh, I mean, what Duckworth and Lewis wanted was a uniform method that you could essentially apply for all kinds of stoppages, okay, something that would essentially deal with. Uh, all of these sorry all of these kinds of stoppages in a in somewhat unified way. Okay, so, I will now describe the method and I will have just about time for that. Oh, there is uh, I must mention a, a, a method that has been put out by uh, a person from India and uh, this is actually something that comes closest to the Duckworth uh, Lewis method. So, um, okay, what is desired of a good method? Uh, maybe uh, I'll skip this. Uh, okay, uh, here's the basis of the method. The batting side, whichever team is batting, whether it's batting first or uh, uh, batting second, it has two resources at its disposal. The two resources are overs and wickets. So let's actually look at the team batting first it is trying to set a target, it has these two resources at its disposal and what should it do with these resources? It should try to set as large a target as possible, okay, maximize its score. All right, overs to go and wickets at hand, both of these matter and in some combined way and we need to figure out in what way and so uh, 20 wicket, 20 overs when 10 wickets are in hand for example is much more valuable than when you have only one wicket in hand, okay. So, if you have only one wicket in hand, chances are uh, if it is Harbhajan Singh, you might get a couple of sixes, but he is going to get out uh, very soon. If it is Varun Arun, he is going to get run out in a couple of uh, balls anyways. Okay. So, um, team 2's target must essentially be reset based on the resources that it has before the interruption in case there is an interruption for team 2. And you also have to take into account uh, resources it has before the interruption and after the this should be such that ideally, and this is the ideal, but there are many words here which are left undefined. 
the relative positions of the two teams should be the same before and after the interruption ok. But what does relative positions mean ok this is something that is subject to interpretation. Um, maybe I will ask for a couple of uh, thoughts on what relative positions what does positions mean. So, how would you measure relative positions any, any thoughts? Runs code. So, what you are thinking of is you are thinking of treating uh, runs as some sort of resource and you want to uh, sorry some sort of wealth and you essentially want to make sure that whatever wealth they have before the interruption after the interruption also they have the same sort of wealth. There is another possibility you can go and uh, sorry someone interrupted me ok. So, not uh, uh, I think you have done probability and statistics I saw that you had some some session there. Maybe what you should look for is make sure that the probability of winning before the interruption and after the interruption remains the same ok. So, so that, that is also a valid criterion it is called the ISO probability uh, criterion. But what um, uh, the Duckworth Lewis method does is it, uh, it essentially tries to keep the wealth sort of the same equalizes the wealth so to speak. Ok. So, um, we will view the total runs that can be scored as a function of overs to go and wickets in hand as the net value of the resources ok. So, we have resources overs and wickets how much can you do with, the, with these resources ok that is the wealth that you have that is the endowment that, that you are left with. And if your uh, resources come down we will essentially bring down your target also accordingly ok and somehow we have to essentially make a mapping get a mapping from resources to the wealth the runs ok. So, let us call that z of u comma w ok z of u comma w is the number of runs that you can score when you have at your disposal u overs which are left and w wickets that are available. By the way these slides are available on the on the web maybe I will indicate how you can get them. Uh, so, that you can go and uh, take a look at it afterwards if you want. And so, we need to come up with a method to come to identify what the z of u w is. So, here is so, I call this the run production function ok. The team batting first is like a factory they have some resources and they are essentially coming up with products and the products is runs ok. So, some sort of an economic uh, interpretation ok. What is their run production function with this much well this, so with this much endowment runs or sorry overs and wickets how many runs can they score ok. Suppose a team has all 10 wickets and it starts playing what is the score that it can get when it has 40 overs when it has 50 overs when it has 60 overs ok. You just say that ok go ahead and play you have 40 overs you have all 10 wickets in hand in hand how much runs would you score. So, let us take a look at it. If you have 20 overs how much well, let us come up with some numbers how many runs would you score you have all 10 wickets in hand, but you have 20 overs left 120, 150, 150 ok 20 overs t 20, 150 is sort of uh, what is par score these days 180 ok 180 maybe you should say 180 because you have only 20 overs, but you have all 10 wickets in hands. And uh, we have many examples where people have scored on the average I think 160, 180 seems a little too high maybe 160 let us say 8 runs and over that is that is good with 10, 10 wickets uh, and uh, 20 overs. But what if you have 40 overs will it be 160 times 2 3 ok what will it be. So, it is not going to be 320 but it is going to be something a little smaller ok. So, straight away you see something that people in economics see it is called diminishing returns ok. So, if you have 20 overs that means something, but if you have 20 more overs and the same 10 wickets in hand you are going to lose you are going to take chances you are going to lose wickets it is not that you are going to last possibly all 40 overs you may not be able to use it to the fullest possible potential. And so, it is not like you are starting afresh in the second half of the game with 10 wickets in hand ok. You take a risk you lose wickets that is where you will start from in the second half and therefore, it is not 160 times 2 ok there is diminishing returns ok 240 or so 40 overs 240 or so 50 overs 
Okay, it's not going to be that you just add another AT again. So there's going to be some some bringing down. So there is diminishing return. So they play according to one day rules, but let's just say that okay, you have 20 overs, you have 40 overs. It's a different kind of uh, restriction. What's the maximum that they can score? The total runs that they can score until they lose all 10 wickets in hand is actually a random quantity, but let's take an average and figure out. That's what you said. 20 overs, 10 wickets in hand, 240. Sorry, 160. 20 overs, 40. Uh, sorry, 40 overs, 10 wickets in hand, um, 240 or thereabouts. So, let's say that uh, if you essentially play forever, I don't give any limit. With these 10 wickets, go and score as many runs as you can. Okay? I'll call that as Z naught. Yeah, it's a random quantity, but I'll take its average. What do you think? Yeah? No, no over limit. What what would you score? Sorry. 400 or, or thereabouts, okay. So, uh, what you do is you um, essentially come up with this and you model the average runs that you will score in some fewer number of overs in this particular fashion. So, here is the maximum that you can ever score with no limitation and then if you have a certain over limitation, you get 1 minus e to the minus p. Okay. So, here is a plot. So, this is your run production function. And this is when you have all 10 wickets in hand. But what if you have only 5 wickets? First of all, okay, this is this is only a model. You have to essentially find out what the, there are two parameters to this model. One is what the maximum that you can, you said 400 or something, but is that really so? You can actually go and test in the data whether it is indeed the case. If this is the model that, uh, if this is the pattern that past matches have. And also, you can learn about B, what this uh, exponential uh, rate is. That is the difference goes down to 0 at an exponentially fast rate and that rate is B. U is the number of overs, B is the rate at which it decays, okay. So, you can essentially go using the data that is available, identify what the Z0 and B ought to be. But what if you have not 10 wickets, but 9 wickets or 8 wickets? Well, you can actually go and look at the history of games and come up with a similar model except that the Z0 will be something a little smaller and you will come up with another curve, okay. And so, I'm, here is a means by which you can actually go back and look in the data or database of all matches and identify the, uh, uh, the data points that you need and identify what Z0 and B ought to be, you can estimate them. I will not worry about that. It is a, it's a fitting of the curve and I have also provided this data set for you to, for those of you who are interested uh, to play with. But what if you have uh, a fewer number of resources, then what you do is, uh, let me just, uh, if wickets have fallen, uh, then you will essentially come up with a different uh, multiplication factor, it will saturate at a different level. Okay, it won't go all the way up to Z0, which is Z0 of 10, but it will go to Z0 of 9, if there are 9 wickets in hand, or Z0 of 8 and so on. And so, one gets a curve like this one gets a curve like this, okay. So, this is the curve when you have all 10 wickets, this is the curve when you have all 9 wickets, this is the curve when you have, oh, sorry, 9 wickets when you have 8 wickets and so on. One interesting feature of this curve is that the slope at this particular point is all the same, okay. What is that indicating? Well, this is basically saying that the rate of change of this production function, okay, the rate at which runs will increase, when you have only epsilon, a very small amount of uh, um, uh, now, very small number of overs, uh, the, the runs that you will score, that is the, that's the slope at this particular point, okay. So, that means that the marginal uh, rate at which you will score, okay, the marginal run scored per unit over, per, per, per unit of overs remaining is all the same and that actually sort of makes sense that they must all have the same slope because if you have only one ball that is available, whether you have 10 wickets in hand or 9 wickets in hand or 8 wickets in hand does not matter, right. How much, how many runs you can increment is uh, the same. So, that is the reason why all of these essentially have uh, the same slope. And so, what one does, I will just say it in words and I will stop. What one does is one finds out uh, how many resources have been lost due to the rain, okay. So, let us say the team batting first plays and it scored 250, the team batting second 
played and it let's say it lost about 20 overs what you do is you essentially find out how many how much of the resource fraction has been lost okay and because we essentially have this you use this information to figure out what the resources lost is and therefore what resources they have and you essentially go down in proportion of the resources that have been lost. So that is the essence of the uh, Duckworth Lewis method. I have run out of time, so I will stop here. Okay, thanks a lot, sir, for the absolutely engrossing, intriguing talk. I am myself a cricket fan, and I think I became a bigger cricket fan now. I am sure everybody here does. And probably